Okay, are we going now or? Welcome everybody. I'm Mark Jonathan Harris. And tonight I'm having the privilege to have a conversation with Leo Chang. Uh, Leo is a Taiwanese American filmmaker, splits his time between San Francisco and Taiwan. He was a student at USC where I've taught for many years. And I recently worked with Leo uh, on the Asian American series for PBS. Leo directed two of the series and I uh, consulted on the series and argued with Leo. Uh, In the most productive way. <laughs> tonight we're uh, here to talk about his uh, wonderful film, uh, Our Time Machine which uh, has been in over 75 festivals worldwide. It's won 12 awards, and it's currently nominated for the prestigious Gotham uh, Awards. Uh, and I think the film is it's sort of a wonderful, rich, multi-layered film. And when I was watching the film again, I thought that this is really, this is a, a a love story. It's a, uh, a love story between about a, a son's love for his father, and it's about an artist's love for his art. And then in probably it's about a 40 year old bachelor finally finding love. Uh, so could you talk about all three threads of this film and also what drew you to this film in the first place? Well, so um, thank thank you, Mark, for uh, for uh, uh, hosting this this conversation. I'm you know looking forward to talking to you about the film. Um, uh, you know, for, for us, my film partner Young on, on this project, uh, my directing partner, is actually the one that discovered uh, the story. Um, Malang, uh, who's based in uh, Malang, who's our main character, uh, the artist um, who created this the, the stage performance. Uh, was uh, embarking, you know, on, on the journey of creating this piece of work in Shanghai, and he wanted somebody to come and do a short behind-the-scene video. And he, uh, through a common friend, he reached out to Young. Um, there's actually a USC connection here that I will mention shortly. Um, and uh, uh, Young, uh, after Young met with Ma Liang, um, Young was actually super moved. Um, by my own story um, beyond just you know wanting to do a, a simple behind the scenes video um, the the swimming pool story which actually is featured really prominently in our film um, really uh, hit um, it really resonated with young very much um, he just felt like um, there was much more to this that there was this really beautiful relationship at the core of this creative project that that was about to to take off and and he wanted to do a, a longer piece beyond just a short um, project. So, and then I actually came on um, along with uh, our executive producer, producer Gene, uh, later that year. This was in, back in 2015, um, and uh, I came on at first as a producer. But it became pretty quickly that uh, this film needed a uh, a 40 something year old perspective. Um, young was very young at at at, at the um, at the beginning of the production. He was only 25. He had just recently graduated from the communications university in in uh, in of China in Beijing, where I met him a few years prior because I was leading a a, a group of USC students for the exchange program um, in Beijing. So it all felt like fate that I was going to end up um, you know working on this project. Um, so that's that's how we um, initially got it going. Um, in terms of the love story, um, you know. I don't necessarily think that we articulated that to ourselves until uh, maybe in the post-production process, but but I think in our gut, we knew that that's what the film was about. It was about love, it was about memory, it was about life. Um, they're, you know, huge, in some ways, grandiose subject matters to tackle for a documentary uh, film. But at some point, we we realized that that's what we were striving for. We wanted to, to make a film about love and life well you know you know in making documentaries there's there you know three sort of elements kind of you you plan to shoot some things 
some things are serendipitous and then of course you shape all these things in the editing and you know looking at the the film uh uh there were certain scenes that i wondered how you decided to uh, to film them uh you were this was filmed over a period of how many years um it's about three years even though the very the last year we were really waiting for the finale to happen <laughs> yes uh but uh so how did you decide okay this is i'm going to shoot this this is a scene that seems to me to be that will be uh dramatic or pivotal in the film well we we, we came into the project knowing that there was going to be two threads that we would focus on you know one is the the, the production of the the puppet performance right um the uh, the creation um the artistic creation is really um, was mesmerizing to us and then you know in, in many ways sold us on this this story um, Marianne's puppetry work um, and we knew that that actually was going to provide us with a, a clear structure like a timeline of you know that there's going to be a production of this play the play will face some challenges during the process of, of, of you know producing it and then there was going to be a, a performance or premiere of the play um, concurrently, uh, we knew that we wanted to focus on the family relationship, uh, what's going to happen to um, the father and son, and also um, the mother and the sister, in a lesser extent, um, as the father's um, condition, you know, uh, out, his dementia, his Alzheimer's um, disease um, gets progressively worse. Um, so those were kind of the two rough concepts that, that we had. We also knew that there was there were two worlds that we were tackling. One is a more magical, more surreal world of the puppetry world, and one is a, a more realistic, gritty world of this family in the city. You know, dealing with um, the very real struggle of you know of this illness and of just aging and of just sort of time passing in general. Um, so. Um, Young, who who shot uh, a lot of the film, he had very clear um, reactions to the stories that Madame was sharing with him. You know, especially with the swimming pool story, I think it got him thinking about you know how to portray those stories. And um, where we landed was that we wanted to have the puppets reenact in some way, sort of act out these um, memories, these these, these stories um, that Madame had. We, we didn't know how we necessarily were going to use it, um, you know, and if, if anything, if, if we show the, these, you know, scenes in, in, in their full, the, the way that they kind of were, were shot and, and edited together, it might've been a bit too much, um, but we knew that, that these images was going to be unusual and, and special and great contrast to the well, you, you know, you use the puppets very well in terms of the swimming pool story, but also uh, when Marion comes back from New York after he's failed to get financing, you have his nightmare, which I thought was the, uh, was really a very good use of that. I mean, that's a scene that was planned, but there are these kind of things which you shoot uh, serendipitously, like the birthday party, when he makes a birthday wish. What is I? What do I want? I want a wife, and you have no idea at the time. I'm sure that this is actually going to materialize. In a, well, uh, he hadn't met uh, her at the, yeah. his wife at that time. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, it, 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 if you, you know, I mean, this is sort of film geek talking. Um, there were definitely elements like that. You know, the the birthday. Um, you know, the declaration of, of my not wanting a wife, but there's, there were also, you know, I mean, the fact that he loves Pinocchio at the beginning and, and, and so much of, of my own story with the puppet and also just his relationship with his art, his relationship with his father, a lot of that sort of echoes the, the Pinocchio story. Um, the, the, I, the idea of, of time, being a machine, you know, father basically saying um, at the hospital that the machine is broken, that that it just doesn't work anymore. I mean, those were those were things that was way beyond our control, but just by total chance that that that's what they talked about, and and there were all always these 
clocks everywhere in their lives and you know we'll try to figure out how to utilize those images um, without it being too you know hit people too too much over the head but then th those are things that when the film is just uh when you come to edit that those are things that you discover i mean uh obviously the letter the framing device the letter to his child was something that you couldn't imagine when he was still single <laughs> did that well, only uh, yeah, when, how, how, how did that come up how did that come about no that that came actually much much later in in the editing process um you know, I think by that time we already had a, an assembly of the film, and uh, for a while we were using, you know, interviews with Ma Liang in, in at those moments um, because I think that we we're getting the feedback that that we weren't getting into his head enough necessarily that there there weren't enough moments where he just kind of shares with us what's going on in 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 in, in his mind, and when we tried to use the interview, it just didn't feel right. It felt stilted. It felt um, sort of inappropriate. Um, it just interrupted the flow of, of the narrative. Um, you know, at the same time, we had all these uh, stylized pieces um, that we wanted to find a way to work in, in, into the film organically. And, and so we, we started to kind of think about like well what 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 is it that we can do to basically build these interstitials that both you know let the audience delve deeper into Marianne's um, head but at the same time you know bring us into this magical realm that that we have been you know sort of creating the, the these images that that we want to find a way to to work into this very realistic story um so the letter um Malan is also a writer. He's actually published a, a couple of books of essays, and, and a lot of the the, the, the texts from the letters were were actually his own writing. Um, I was I was going to ask whether the, the, these were his writings or yours, or it's a combination. Of it's a combination. There there was I think one piece was something that we kind of came up um, and and work with him on it, but uh, the bulk of the other pieces came from his own writing. I think like any artist, um, you know, people artists are obsessed with the same themes in whatever medium they're in. Mm -hmm. Madang's obsessed with his childhood, with the idea of time, with the father-son relationship. Um, so he's written a lot about it. Um, and, and uh, yeah, you know, the, the father-son relationship is clearly, I mean, he states in the film that at, at, a, at a certain point he came, he felt, Bank, not bankrupt, that's the wrong word, he felt stuck as an artist. And it, it clearly, this show was a way of working his way out of that and resolving issues that must have been at the core of his work. So I could see that. Yeah, and also that the the thread, there's just also this thread of an artist's journey and, you know, sort of the illogical nature of, of, of creating art, which spoke so much to me. Um, you know, it, it's it's incredibly resonant for me. You know, to I, I I feel like I all my career I'm plagued by the imposter syndrome. I think that a lot of other filmmakers or even you know any kinds of artists writers can probably relate to that. Um, I feel like often you know once in a while I feel like I'm not worthy. Uh, I uh, people will see through me really quickly, and somebody's going to take my pen away you know, like, like the story in, in the film. So, um, but also that the way that I and, and people I know, you know, I'm sure you, yourself included, Mark, that we, we, we can't help ourselves, but just want to keep doing it. Well, you also see, I mean, I'm sure it, for all filmmakers, it's easy to identify with the problems of getting financing not having enough money. I mean, that, that's something all documentary filmmakers can uh, relate to. Oh my God, we have to stop now and raise some money. So, uh, but also what uh, I appreciated about what you were able to show is you also see his joy in his work when something works, you know, when the hand works or the, mo you know, the, the kind of moments. And when he finds his, you know, collaborator too, he, they're the moments of, ah, aha moments that, that, that 
those are the things when you put two pieces of film and a piece of music together and something happens that uh, is better than the, than the parts, that that's what keeps us all going, you know. Uh, 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 which, uh, there are more questions, but that leads to the music, which is, uh, I think, an essential part of the success of this film. Uh, so could you talk about um, the, the music and working with the composer with uh, Stephen Brill? Because I, I thought the music was really uh, very affecting in the film. Yeah, um, Paul, Paul Brill. Oh, Paul. Stephen music. Brill is somebody else, yes. <laughs> um, and Paul, Paul's a, a, a wonderful composer and very experienced. And um, I, you know, I, I, we had a hard time. I had a hard time deciding on a composer for, for this film. Um, I, I was in conversation uh, with several different composers for a long time during the post-production process. And it just, nothing felt right. Like nothing made me feel feel settled that 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 we were going to go with the right person um and well, how, do you, how do you decide did you ask them for is it how do you audition a composer well i i think that you know i share the cut with them and then we talk about the film and then i ask for their previous work and i try, I try to extrapolate from their work to see how that style might fit or not, you know, with with the, the the film that I'm working on. And I know that many composers actually are quite versatile and they can do very different style. But I had I have to see something that I feel like can translate into uh, the the work that I was working on. I think this piece was tricky because we wanted again, like part of it is fantasy, you know, part of it is this sort of magical world. But at the same time, you know, that the music needs to bridge both and and you know sometimes you know when I was getting samples people were giving me stuff that felt like it was like a Disney soundtrack you know um, because people saw this as sort of like a, 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 a Pinocchio yeah exactly like a, it's a it's a it's a it's a kid story it's a fable which it is you know but but not that much of it you know um, and with Paul you know, it was sort of like we were already towards the end of, of the rough cut and uh, I, I just was being super indecisive and Paul was somebody who I had approached for a, a previous film that, that he wasn't able to work on and so I circled back to him and I showed him the film and we got on the phone and he would just, I don't even remember what he said, but whatever he said was it, it, again, it was sort of, it, 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 it connected with me in the most visceral way. And right there and right then I knew that he was the right person. And, and, and you know, and I've, I offered, uh, uh, you know, the, the job to him, I, you know, just right then. And, and it, it really, you know, I mean, I was so, I'm really, really thrilled about how the music turned out. I think that he really captured um, the intricacy and the and this and the, the different gradation of emotion um, that we have in the film, and he really captured the magic. Um, and you know, so, so a lot of his music almost sounds like sound effect. You know, it, it it feels like the scratches and the plucking and the 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 metal and the wood and the leather straps from the puppet. You know, making um, making sounds and percussive sounds and and, and somehow uh, morphing into these really beautiful moments of, of melody and, 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 you know, all of that. Um, so, and we do have several sequences in the film that were really basically musical montages, you know, because we needed to compress time or we, we needed to um, have these, uh, uh, you know, underneath all the, the letters to the child were these beautiful pieces of music that needed to work with both the narration and also these um, stylized images. And, and, you know, I, I I'm just really thorough about how the music turned out. Um, how long an editing process was it? Um, it was that it was sort of a tough to figure out. So our editor um, Bob Lee, who is a fantastic editor, um, he's based in Beijing. Um, initially, we were all working remotely, and basically, we're doing you know we handed over the footage and gave him a rough outline and then put him to work. Um, but after a few months, we, it became clear that that process was kind of working itself to, to, to the, the end of its effectiveness that we need to kind of, you know, uh, take the next step to, to work closer together. So, so, so I, st we, we started organizing these edit 
boot camps. <laughs> so kind of the way I, I saw it. I was in, in, in San Francisco at the time. Yang was in, um, my, my directing partner was in Shanghai. Bob was in Beijing and Jean was in New York. Um, so Jean, I, yeah, yeah Jen, um, who, who is also an editorial consultant on the project besides being um, the executive producer. Um, so I was like, well, we should, we need to all get together somehow. So, so I started to rent these Airbnbs in different, <laughs> in different Chinese cities and all of us will come together, uh, and sleep and edit for three weeks and do nothing else together. Well, not, not Gene initially, but you know, like Bob uh, Young and I did it in, um, in Shanghai. We did it in Xiamen, which is the uh, uh, Southeast is like across uh, from from Taipei, uh, not very far from here, uh, which is where I am right now. We did something uh, two weeks here in Taipei, and then at the very end, uh, Bob, the editor, and I went to Jean's apartment in New York uh -huh. and edited there for for several weeks. No, I, I've made films like that, and I find you know you can do a lot remotely, but in the end, everybody has to be in the same editing room, and you know. It's, it, it, I think otherwise it's really, really difficult. Well, I, I, the, the problem is I also have this really bad habit of finishing my own film. I, I started as an editor after I finished SC, I actually edited several films before I figured out that, that if I was the editor, that was the film that I was making, I didn't have the capacity to make another film as a director. So I, I shifted towards shooting and, and directing, but, um, but I always wanted to, be the last pair of hands on a film. And, and at this point, I'm basically, I'm telling the editors I work with, like, I just, this is how I work and I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with you. You know, it, 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 it works out for me. So um, as, <laughs> as we were uh, doing pre-production on Asian Americans at night, I was actually editing the film um, by myself uh, uh, at, in, in, in LA. Um, you know that. <laughs> yeah, so. So I, I did that for a couple months, um, at late 2018 in, in November and December. Um, and then ultimately we finished the film in LA. Uh, you know, the editing is uh, really quite lovely. Uh, I, in, in a lot of places, you, I thought the sequence where you can compress uh, the puppeteer falling in love was I'm sure taken from you know weeks of uh, shooting, uh, and so that, that whole sequence with, which ends with their holding hands, I thought was really very deftly done, very sort of subtly done. And I, I probably shouldn't reveal this, but I, that we did that out of necessity because that, that I was really frustrated. You know, Young and I were, were I was like, why why don't we have any images of their courtship? Well, that, what I was going to ask you was, did you realize this was happening at the time or only belatedly? I, I, because we didn't realize that it was happening at the time. And so we didn't have too many images of, of, that we could use to build that relationship. And that actually ended up to be something that we struggled with in post-production because we had that really great flirtation scene of them dancing together, which could be perfectly innocuous but with the right context it's you know they're literally dancing around each other you know uh, you know a, a, in terms of a course you, you, yes and, and but do you see them i thought it was very well done and then you i i assumed that you knew that he was going to propose to her that you were tipped off <laughs> yeah. that, that, yeah. that scene but it, it ends it ends very well i mean i think um it's a kind of film where it's really multi-layered. One, and but all these things fit together. They fit, I mean, the, the themes of, I mean, for me, it was about love and aging and time. Uh, I mean, the principal struggle is the father and son relationship. And you were fortunate to be able to see the father before his dementia was uh, really it made him uh, <clears throat> less functional. Uh, so that then when he first says, you know, I've made 80, I directed 80 operas, 
it's charming at the beginning and then you realize that th this is all that he can talk about his career that and and so you were by by filming over such a long period of time you were able to see his gradual decline uh and, and so we got some sense of him at the beginning of what he must have been like when he had all his faculties intact you know so uh um, yeah, the, the, the 80 plays uh, story was an interesting device for, for us. Um, you know, initially, we had really conceptualized the dad as an equal character as the son. At least that's what we thought would happen because Marian very much wanted uh, that. Yeah, th he wanted that. He, he, yes, he yes. thought that this was going to be a true collaboration. Yeah. Um, but it became really quickly obvious to all of us, including Ma Liang, that that was not going to be the case. Um, so we had to, you know, rethink our our main story, um, you know, after that. Um, but but the but the the eighty plays uh, story, um, you know, he he keeps repeating that and keeps repeating that. And when we're sitting in pose, we try to figure out how do we show. How do we manifest the decline in a way that can be really quickly understood while at the same time really kind of demonstrate that this is a, a, a man, you know, at his prime was really powerful and, and was, you know, a force. Um, and that, that, that story of him, you know, uh, that, that he keeps repeating ends up to be in many ways the perfect element that we can repeat throughout the film and, and achieve that, that. Yeah, yeah, I think it worked very well. Um, I have a, a few more questions. I, I, we should say to people watching that if you have questions that, that we haven't uh, raised, that you can put them in the chat. We'll be happy to, uh, to ask them of Leo. Uh, so just a, a, use the chat if you have some other questions. Um, so, uh, what I wasn't clear about in the film uh, was his reputation, Malian's reputation as a puppeteer. I mean, I thought the work was quite impressive, but he's having trouble raising money. And I wonder what was the response to his show? Uh, and how is he regarded uh, in China? Well, he's regarded as a, you know, quite a respected, um, photographer and conceptual artists. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why Young was, you know, so taken, my film partner Young, so taken by Ma Liang was because Young actually studied Ma Liang in college. Ah. That, that, that the, his work was, was presented in the curriculum. Um, so, so he's, you know, Ma Liang has done a couple of projects that was quite, quite well known in China. Maybe not so much internationally because I think there's a really certain type of Chinese art that gains international acclaim, right? It usually has to do with it, it much more connected to the the history and to the political situation in China. Um, Ma Lang's work is much more whimsical, much more um, you know playful, and maybe not in some ways not Chinese specific or much more of a fusion, maybe. Um, but he's not really ever done any theater and he's not really ever done, um, I mean, he's done puppets as sculptures, but not done a puppet show. Um, so, uh, you know, the play was received well, um, but I think that, that they really had their challenges um, with, with the play because it is a big production. Um, it's quite expensive. And uh, uh, you know, to be able to run it successfully and profitably, um, you know, didn't have any celebrity attached or anything like that. So it, it was probably kind of difficult to compete. Um, and because they did have um, some, you know, money issues and also some other logistical behind the scenes issues that that maybe prevented it from being fully realized that the way that he probably wanted it. Um, but they did have a successful run, a couple of successful runs in Shanghai and also one successful run in Beijing. I think the production is still trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the next steps are They're, they're Yeah, they're still wanting to, to get the, get the show out there. Um, well, but Manal, you know, yeah. your film may 
help that. Uh, we hope so. We hope so. But Manal is very much, you know, I mean, he, he, you know, for him, this was a really unusual piece of work. I mean, he, you know, you're, you're mentioning the difficulty of raising money and all that. He's not used to that. He's a photographer. Mm. You know, he used to just, you know, having very few, very little resource and then just going out with a small crew and, and shoot really, you know, the kind of work exact, exactly how he would like it. Mm -hmm. um, and for this one, he was really struggling with the big machinery that he was tasked with pushing forward. You know, um, there's a there's a sort of a what's the adjective like a Sisyphus, like Sisyphusian yeah. effort to it that is actually in many ways ended up in the the play itself, you know, in, in the puppet play itself. So um, so he did end up doing another uh, piece of puppetry work after this one, but it was much more of a interactive piece where he just built this really, really fantastic tall um, uh, like one story tall puppet uh, um, that goes up. Actually, people can literally go up to, to the puppet and then the puppet will interact with, with uh, it. Well, yeah, he's obviously uh, extremely talented. Uh, there are There is one political element of the film. You talk about the father's experience uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Um, I wonder, has, did that raise any questions? You're from Taiwan, of course, not for you, may not from, not from, from uh, China. Main, mainland China, yes. Uh, but uh, were there any comments about that? I, I think oh, it's, yeah. it, it's easier to, these days to talk about the Cultural Revolution than it is about other things, but it's still a little um, problematic. I think depending on what you want to do, with this conversation about culture. You're, you're right. I, I think that what, what has become clear to me uh, in, term, in the context of talking about culture revolution in China in a public open forum, which you know we, we, we have plans to distribute this film in China, we actually did end up getting, um, um, getting screening permission, but getting a screening permit um, to have a theatrical distribution in China, which meant that we had to go through the censorship process. So mm -hmm. um, literally that that culture revolution piece is, I don't know, three minutes, if that. Um, we got pushed back. We, we were yeah. asked, yeah, we were, we were asked to, uh, to reconsider. Um, it was a, it was, it was very difficult that I found that the process, um, you know, it, 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 I, I wouldn't want to go through it again. Um, even though it, 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 in many ways, it actually, we, we kind of came out relatively, relatively unscathed. And, and if anything, uh, the reaction kind of pushed us to be more creative. Um, but they were, we were constantly- uh, did, You did have to make some changes? So initially that, that, uh, that cultural revolution sequence were literally cultural revolution images. You know, um, the, the the response was these are illegal foreign images that are, uh, is not allowed to be shown in China. And then the second iteration, we had tried to use um, some old propaganda posters, you know, those really colorful ones of that showing um, uh, the Red Army or the the the. the you the, can see the the posters you can see in the Shanghai Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That was not good either. Um, and I think that the final pass, we decided to use those stylized sequences of, of, um, of the Peking Opera performers. Um, and that ended up working. And we actually were happy about that because I think that that was much more stylistically appropriate to our film. Um, so, so we were lucky in that way, but the whole process through, we were constantly asking ourselves, like, what is the line that we won't cross? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that for us, if we were asked to take out the story altogether, we would have just given up on, on the Chinese market um, altogether and not pursue it because we didn't think that that we were willing to make that compromise and sacrifice. Um, but the, the story was was kept intact. Um, you know, the, uh, it, it was, and, and, and like you're saying, it is more appropriate to talk about it, but you can really only talk about it in a very personal 
way. You cannot comment it on, on it as a phenomenon or as a historical event. You can talk about how it impacted your family. Well, it, it certainly, I mean, many artists, uh, almost all artists suffered from it. And, and it, it, it's, it's certainly relevant to um, the story because when he came back after the Cultural Revolution, he was driven to really uh, to, to, to direct as many productions as he could, which has an impact on his son, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that event, you know, we all know it's seismic, but I don't think that a lot of us really consider how specifically it impacts individuals that, that, you know, some of us are, you know, are fortunate to know some people who have, I mean, not necessarily fortunate to know that they, they've gone through it, but, but to, to be able to understand like the, the, the really specific impact and it's, it, not only specific, it reverberates through generations. Yeah, and I and, and I think that that's that's certainly relevant uh, to your film. Uh, you know, thinking about, I mean, you're uh, among a uh, a younger generation of filmmakers from China. Yes, <laughs> compared to me, definitely a younger generation, but who work. Um, in both worlds, but work work out of China, work in the United States, trying to make films that are uh, universally relevant. Uh, uh, I mean, can you talk about that? How do you see your position as uh, 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 sort of straddling these two different worlds? I mean, I, I think that you know, for for me, it, it, I I have colleagues, you know, who who you know as well, friends yeah. in, in the documentary world who. Uh, making really amazing work, um, people like Nam Fu, people like Hao, um, you know, they're making really fantastic work uh, about China before the international audience. I, I'm in a slightly different position because I'm from Taiwan and and the there is really a huge cultural gap between Taiwan and China. So even though I do know the culture and the society maybe more than, than people outside of the, the Chinese diaspora, um, I'm still an outsider to to that world. So, um, so it's been it's been interesting and and sometimes tricky, um, but sometimes it's actually sort of work out to my advantage to be one step removed from that, but do you know have have the ability to to still you know sort of like tell that story in a way that is 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 uh, accessible and digestible to the rest of the world. Um, I feel like I, I, I take this role very seriously. I feel like there needs to be more of, of this type of storytelling. Um, I feel like the, there is a narrative in the West uh, about China and, uh, and, you know, sort of whether China in specific or, um, or what's called Greater China, which is, you know, China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, um, that the West just wants this one main narrative to be reinforced. But the fact is, it's just so much more complicated than that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think the outsider's pr perspective is the perspective of the artist is always somewhat outsider. So that gives you a certain vantage point. There's a question in the chat. Let me uh, raise it. Um, you know, you spoke of the various love stories. I wonder if there are other stories too. I wonder if you could remark on whether there was a meta narrative structural tool it was helpful to weaving all this together. Uh. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I think, I think Mark, I think USC taught me well. I, I, I'm always <laughs> thinking about the narrative structure. Um, we didn't ruin you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it very, very much was something that I was already gravitating towards. You know, I, I, I grew up a, a total cinephile. I love you know, both fiction and nonfiction film. And I, I, I really am thrilled when there's a beautifully constructed narrative. And I, I strive for that in my work. Um, I think that, that, that you know, there, there is this, this um, transformation of, of Ma Liang, you know, our, our main subject's character that we were very much um, building towards, right? That, that, it, that there, there was sort of almost like, it, it, it's, it, it, in, in some ways it's sort of the, the, the stages of grieving that, that we ended up, you know, building the, the, the film around, 
you know, at, when, when Ma Lang finds out about his father's condition, the, the first was disbelief, right? So, so it was very much, he tried to pretend that this thing that he was trying to work on is going to stop time and it's going to stop his father from suffering and, and, and to be able to hold on to his father and preserve him where he wants him to be. That didn't work. So, so the second one is desperation. You know, it's about doing anything he can to, to, to see if he can try to slow things down, to try to see if he can, you know, sort of like uh, uh, hold on to whatever that can, can be held on as long as possible. And of course that doesn't last very long. So the desperation comes up where he's despondent. He thinks the world is not a beautiful place that, that does not de de deserve all this beauty. Um, uh, that that all his work and, and his life's work is for naught. And that very much reflects upon his own mortality and his own um, uh, concern and panic about where he is in his life and in his work. Um, but landed on this last piece of um, sort of acceptance and, and, and resignation, resignation, but in the, in the most beautiful way, which is that, that, that to celebrate life as it is, to, to really accept the messiness of life to not try to stop the flow of time but to really celebrate it um so and, and to be able to live in the moment live in the moment very and, much it's and, a, you know i mean it, it's it, enjoy it, the even if the moment is repeated <laughs> yeah that it's yeah. you know and, and it's, it's something that that really does does resonate with me you know um and and something that i, I aspire to do that i don't necessarily do very well but um, I, I really appreciated that that was the message that, that he landed on. And that's what, how we were able to, you know, um, uh, sort of relay that, that idea to the audience through his story. Well, that, uh, I, I think uh, 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 we've not exhausted this su su subject, but, but uh, talked a lot, uh, raised the central issues. Is there anything more you want to say? I think um, if people have tuned in late or haven't seen the film, maybe you should tell them where they can see this film. Yeah, so um, if you're in the US, uh, it, it, actually it's streaming free right now on uh, the MT, uh, PBS uh, POV series website. So if you go to pbs.org and find POV, uh, you'll be able to see the film. Um, it's also available on uh, all the streaming platforms. Well, on, on the on Amazon, on um, on iTunes, Apple TV, not on Netflix. Um, so, uh, and if you're a, a member of the Academy, yeah. it's available um, in the uh, Netflix is lost. It's Netflix. Sorry? It's, it's Netflix, Netflix lost. lost. <laughs> not to be. Able I to like to think so. <laughs> Um, so, so if you're in the Academy, you can, you can find it on the Academy screening room room as well. Um, so, and if you do enjoy the film or, or enjoy listening to us talk, uh, there, there are actually a couple more, uh, Q and A's uh, that are coming up the next couple of weeks. I think we're doing basically Q and A's every Thursday. So, um, if you kind of follow us on, on social media at uh, time machine film, uh, or the website timemachinefilm.com, you can continue to uh, uh, follow our uh, progress and uh, get updates. Well, thank you, Leo. I hope people uh, get a chance to watch the film. It's, uh, I think, deeply affecting and uh, marvelously put together. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And so glad we got to chat. Yeah, good. Good to talk. All right. All so right. we do we we sign off now? Continue. Yeah, we, we sign off. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.